just by saying that these slides are online. Uh, they are not necessarily interactive, but I'm going to be citing a lot of sources, and you may or may not want to read up on some of them, so all of those citations are in the presentation. All right, so I'm AG Dubs. You might know me from Twitter, where I'm prolific in a very certain type of tweet. I don't recommend you follow me. Um, but I come to you from a company called NPM. How many people know what NPM is? Yay! Cool, uh, so this is my first time in Oklahoma, and me and the wombat are extremely happy to be here. By the way, there are more of these wombats. You should come and find me. <laughs> um, but at NPM, I have an interesting title. I'm called the Developer, Community, and Content Specialist. Actually, manager, I don't know why I said specialist. But anyways, pretty much it means if you don't know how NPM works, that's my problem. <laughs> so I'm often known as the documentation person. I also do the tutorials and I do a lot of conferences. Um, so I'm particularly well suited for this job because for a very long time I've said that I like to think about thinking. And so you can kind of tell us that I majored in philosophy and neuroscience in college. Didn't do any computer science stuff, really. But then I started getting into computers, and then I started getting really excited about the type of thinking that happens when people write code. And so you can often see in my spare project, in spare time, I write things like this. This is going to be a real game, by the way. I get excited. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to be talking to you guys today about cows in space. That's why you're here, right? We're here for Cows in Space? No? Uh, maybe, maybe let's talk about art. This is some good art I found online. <laughs> Super good art. Hope you like it. Uh, alright, alright. We're here to talk about JavaScript. We love it, right? In particular, we're going to talk about ES6 2015. And you know what? I'm not going to call it that for the rest of this talk. And if that makes you upset, I don't care. <laughs> All right, so this is my ES6, cow in space. All right, but before we do that, we're going to talk about something that I think is extremely important, and that's called abstraction. And this wouldn't be a good computer science talk if I didn't quote Dijkstra. So let's do it. All right, the effective exploitation of his powers of abstraction must be regarded as the most vital activities of a competent programmer. And so what does this mean? This means that when we're really doing programming, and it's like most programming missed moment, we are abstracting. And this is really important. And what do we mean by abstraction, right? So Benjamin C. Pierce, in his like very famous book, Types and Programming Languages, or TAPL, which if you haven't read, I recommend, uh, he defines the abstraction principle as this. Each significant piece of functionality in a program should be implemented in just one place, in the source code. Where similar functions are carried out by distinct pieces of code, it is generally beneficial to combine them into one by abstracting out the various parts. And hopefully, as programmers, we're all very familiar with this concept. In fact, for me, this is like the most joyous part of programming. I love being able to see patterns and then break them all down into like this one general thing and take the rest of it out. Deleting code is so much fun, right? But I want to know abstraction more than just in this programmatic, technical way. I want to think about it more theoretically. And so like everyone who's looking for a more academic, theoretical definition, I went to Wikipedia. <laughs> and so this is what Wikipedia says. Wikipedia says, abstraction tries to factor out details from a common pattern so that programmers can work close to the level of human thought. Let's flag that. Uh, leaving out details which matter in practice, but are immaterial to the problem being solved. And I want us to flag that too, all right? Immaterial to the problem being solved. We know, particularly as programmers, that part of solving problems, like actually 90% like of solving a problem, is actually defining the problem. And so one of the big parts of this talk is going to be defining what problem JavaScript is trying to solve. So that we can actually think about good strategies for abstraction in JavaScript. All right, so another little detour. I was lucky enough to be the lead instructor at a program in New York City called the New York City Web Development Fellowship, which is a boot camp program, which aside, I have a lot of feelings about, none of which I will share with you. 
Um, but it took people who had no developer experience, who made less than 40k or were unemployed, and took six months and placed them in junior development jobs. We primarily taught Ruby, but we also taught a little bit of JavaScript. And something that I learned teaching this program, among a lot of other things, was that iteration is hard. So, this is the only slide with code in it. Everyone gets mad about it, whatever. Um, so it was about a week before we were going to start, and the dean of the school and I were at a user group, and he was giving a talk. And he was like, look at this JavaScript. This is garbage, I don't even know what it says, right? But this Ruby, this Ruby, even your mom could understand it. Sidebar? Don't say stuff like that. Moms are cool and smart. Don't be rude. <laughs> so, going on, he said, oh my goodness, this is so beautiful. It's written to read like English, even though it's written by someone who speaks Japanese. We'll get into it. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, he was saying this is good, and you might be getting the suspicion that I'm about to disagree with him. And you're right. But there's a kernel of truth in what he's saying here, and that is this. Programs must be written for people to read, and only incidentally for machines to execute. We need to understand that the people interfacing with our code are, well, they're people. And so it's really important that we be able to reason about our code, instead of just writing it so that a computer can understand it. Uh, this was written by uh, these two excellent hand gesture people, Ibelson and Sussman, who wrote a book that we'll talk about a little later. Uh, but again, we need to flag this idea, human thought, people to read, that's a hard problem. This is my door in Brooklyn, it's hard to read on the projector, but those are instructions for the UPS person to open the door to ring the buzzer, and then a sign that said that they missed me. Uh, I clearly didn't write my uh, sign on the level of human thought. <laughs> um, so yeah, another small story here. Iteration is hard. We've heard the side about Ruby, but it's about three weeks into the program, and I'm sitting at my computer doing some curriculum work, and I hear my assistant teacher, he's teaching iteration. And to, to, to be the nicest about it, it's going poorly. It's going really badly. People are frustrated. Blake, the teacher, is frustrated. It's not going well. And so, if you know me, this wouldn't surprise you, but I decided to do something bold. <laughs> I often do these things, and I said, walked over and I, I completely interrupted the class, and I was like, okay, I have an idea. Forget all the Ruby you just learned. Like, completely forget it. This shouldn't be hard, you're already pissed about it. Um, and I'm like, okay. And I was like, I'm gonna teach you iteration using a language you don't know. And everyone's like, that sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> Give me a chance, you're giving me a chance. Um, and so that's what I did. And I wrote up this for loop. And what's amazing about the JavaScript for loop, as much as we might not like it, because there's a lot of punctuation, uh, is that it exposes the underlying concepts of iteration. If you were to ask someone, what is iteration? What makes up iteration? The answer is state, condition, increment. And it turns out, Right through the syntax? It's right there. Beginners hate magic. They can't control it. They assume that it's hard because they don't know how to do it. But here, using the JavaScript syntax, all of those concepts were exposed to them and they're able to manipulate them. And in this sense, even though they really couldn't write a single line of JavaScript, suddenly iteration made a lot more sense. And they could go back to that JavaScript, uh, to that Ruby each, and even though it wasn't exposed, they did understand what was going on behind the curtain. And in that sense, they felt a lot more empowered. So, from those stories, my secret physicist boyfriend, Richard Feynman, uh, he has something to say about this. He says, the real problem in speech is not precise language. The problem is clear language. It is really quite impossible to say anything with absolute precision unless that thing is so abstracted from the real world as to not rep represent any real thing. So we think about this idea of expressivity, right? That's supposed to be something that helps us express things, understand things. But at the same time, when we remove that, we also expose underlying concepts, and that actually helps things be more understandable, even though it might be the language that's less understandable. 
All right, we have these weird dichotomies between precision and clarity, and abstraction and reality. And when we're choosing to design programming languages to design abstractions, we find ourselves in this kind of mix. So Pablo Picasso, who you may or may not know, is the painter of that beautiful cows in space photo you guys stared at forever. Um, he has something to weigh in as well. He says, there is no abstract art. You must always start with something. Afterward, you can remove all traces of reality. So we have a tough question here. Where should we begin? Where should we begin in designing programming languages? Where should we begin when we're teaching? What do we do? We're kind of in this weird spot. <laughs> so, you might have seen this photo before. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides from basically like any conference I've ever gotten to. If you can't read it, it says, how to draw an owl. Draw some circles. Then it says, draw the rest of the fucking owl. <laughs> that is the only curse word in this talk if I don't mess up. <laughs> um, we have our programming languages, our tools are doing this to us and to our beginners. All right, is this a fun way to learn how to draw? No. How many real good artists are we gonna get out of this? None. All right, no. Good. All right? We're stuck in a position like this, though. Abstraction is this strange, like, goes all the way up and all the way down kind of situation. All right? And it's tough to think about where we begin. So, I'd like to take you on a journey. All right? If you didn't catch it, my title is a Carl Sagan quote. So, again, who missed it? Let's talk about cows in space. All right? So, human beings are amazing pattern recognizers. We're brilliant at it. All right, we're actually really bad at like, short-term memory, things like reading books where we don't have any visual patterns. We're terrible at them. That's why books aren't super popular anymore. It's like our brains aren't built for them. All right? We are able, though, to look at something like this and see this. You, you see it, right? Right? No? Okay, well, someone saw it and they convinced everyone. All right? And so when we recognize patterns and then we give them names, those are our abstractions. All right? Our patterns that we recognize and give names are abstractions. Now, these are really important. There's nothing worse than a bad abstraction. All right? Because our abstractions are what is the fundamental building block of our cultures and our communities. And if you make a bad abstraction, you're going to have a tricky community. And by tricky, I mean dangerously bad. All right? For example, astrology. This is my horoscope from today. It says, your mind should be especially quick and agile. Your pursuit of intellectual interests could lead to group activities. Uh, a lot of information could come your way. You'll enjoy discussing it. OK, actually, this seems really accurate, so let's not use this as an example. Uh-oh. Uh so usually what I do now is show some ridiculous horoscope, but when I checked my horoscope yesterday, I found out that the icon they use for pet horoscopes is the GitHub logo. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you guys that, because I thought that was hilarious. Um, talk about market penetration. All right, um, but yeah, so again what I'm talking about is those abstractions, those patterns we name, we're paving our cow paths. No, I'm not giving up on that metaphor. Um, so, and these are important because again, this is what our communities are based on. So let's talk about JavaScript. JavaScript has been a delightful beginner programming language because it's has lacked abstractions. It's small, it's simple. It's all about to change. <laughs> oh no. All right, so September 28th, 1980 is when the ECMAScript 6 spec was written. Come on, that's definitely not true. All right? No, it's when this amazing show Cosmos started. And this is a show by Carl Sagan. And the point of this show was to take the underlying concepts, the scientific concepts of the universe, and express them to the layman because he believed that in order to actually live well, you needed to understand these things. And this is how he said it. He said, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. 
And I was like, yes. If you wish to learn ES6 from scratch, you must first invent the universe. I know that wasn't Carl Sagan, that was me, but I'd like to think he supports me. Um, all right, so let's finally talk about ES6, right? From the spec, we're gonna read some spec now. ECMAScript syntax is relaxed to enable it to serve as an easy to use scripting language. Now relaxation's cool. I was relaxed until right before this talk and all the technical problems. Uh, but yeah, this relax is good. But is that really why we have JavaScript? Are there not relaxing enough languages out there? Like, relaxation's a good message, but it's not always the right one. This is the first message I got on OkCupid. Super weird. All right. Again, we need to think about the, the problem being solved. I don't think we're writing JavaScript to relax people. And if we are, we're doing a terrible job. Um, we need to ask ourselves, what, what is JavaScript trying to solve? What will be JavaScript's legacy? Like when we look back in history, we'll see this programming language artifact. What's gonna be the little blurb next to it in like whatever iPad textbook we have? Uh, I'm not really sure, but I think it's gonna have to do with this. So this is Lori Voss, the CTO of NPM. This slide was in my talk before I worked there, I promise. Um, so he says this. Fundamentally, it's hard to think of a compelling reason a brand new web dev would learn two languages when they can just learn JavaScript. And he follows up by saying, if I could pick any language in the world to use, both server and client, it might not be JavaScript, but we don't get to pick. So, this brings me to ES6 classes. So, Sugar makes me sick. Like, it actually makes me sick. I have type 1 diabetes. Uh -huh. But syntactic sugar makes me nervous. And you might understand why, but it's because syntactic sugar sometimes obfuscates the underlying concepts. It can go so far as to lie about those underlying implementations. And especially as a teacher, this is concerning. So from the script, uh, from the spec, even though ECMAScript includes syntax for class definitions, ECMAScript objects are not fundamentally class-based. Interesting. <laughs> you might not need class syntax. <laughs> so, if you take anything from this talk, you can ignore everything else, this is what I'd like you to take away. This is George E.P. Box, and he says this, and if anyone, if anywhere, understood this, all of our lives would be easier. He says, remember that all models are wrong. All models are wrong. The practical question is how wrong do they have to be to not be useful? So let's keep this in mind. All right, how wrong are we with classes? So here in the spec it says, in a class-based, object-oriented language in general, state is carried by instances, methods are carried by classes, and inheritance is only of structure and behavior. In ECMAScript, the state and methods are carried by objects, while structure, behavior, and state are all inherited. And so that can be a lot if you've never read the spec, but you expect it's kind of a pain so this guy named Regenwald on Twitter, who's known for saying awesome stuff like this, uh, he wrote a great blog post called Prototypes Enough Classes. And I won't read this to you, but the gist is this. When we teach classes, we understand them as blueprints, right? We have a class or a blueprint, we make instantiate an object or a house. If we think about JavaScript classes, JavaScript classes aren't blueprints. They're model homes. You could, you know, have them be empty, but like, someone could move in to your class. <laughs> and that's kind of a problem. Um, so, JavaScript classes are, well, they're objects. They're, they're not classes, really. Um, I was making some jokes the other day on Twitter. I said, are you ES6? Because you've got the shallow presence of class. So, I'm very good at dating. Um, this is another good reason I'm good at dating. So you might think I'm saying, hey, TC39, go home, you're drunk. Right? No. 
This is not a hate talk. All right? You can easily start shutting down my, my uh, argument by saying, well, what even is a class? Is a class even defined well enough to say that something isn't a class? And be like, that's a good point, but I don't think that's true. And I would tuck your face off about this language. Um, I can't do that now. I do not have enough time. But if you're interested, you can find me. All right, the other thing, though, is this is not a hate talk, but I'm not saying this is OK, either. I don't really think it's OK. This is not fine. Um, I might be saying that JavaScript is trying to do a lot of things that it isn't. Uh, this is a real store outside Madison Square Garden in New York City. Uh, I have not gone in. I assume they do try and do all of this stuff. To what extent or quality, I have no idea. Um, so, uh, Lizzo Leopold has a beautiful talk called Thinking for Programmers. And he quotes this, this cartoon. And he says, writing is nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your thinking is. And this is the crux of what I'm trying to talk about. And I heard this and I was like, I'm going to re rewrite this. I want to say teaching is nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your understanding is. A lot of people have criticized class syntax. I am one of them. What I want to focus on is this perspective we always ignore, which is the educational perspective. When I think about teaching JavaScript classes to beginners, I get more anxious than I was before this talk, because it's going to be very difficult. All right? um, Rich Hickey has an amazing talk called Simple Made Easy, and he defines these two words, and I think this is a good way to start talking about maybe how we confused why we wanted class syntax. He defines the word simple as one fold or braid. So you can think of a string that has one fold. It's very, very simple. And then easy, he takes some, some leniency here, but he says it means to lie near. Easiness means familiarity. All right? So when we think about why we wanted classes, we, we wanted classes because they're familiar. But we don't want to be making an easy language. We want to be making a simple one. And that's something we should consider. So we were talking about Ableton and Sussman earlier. They wrote this seminal computer science education book called The Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. And this was amazing because what they said is, we need to stop teaching programming as syntax. All right, that's not, that's not working. We need to teach programming concepts. And now suddenly you can start thinking about this crisis of teaching JavaScript because we have syntax that does not expose its fundamental concepts. All right, that's a fundamental problem. How we teach this is confusing. All right, and this is important because JavaScript will be the introduction to programming concepts for an entire generation of developers, whether we like it or not. This is the problem or at least one problem that we're solving. All right, so are we totally screwed? Have we like made a big mistake? Not necessarily. So Peter Van Roy wrote a follow-up book to the SSCP called The Computer Concepts, Techniques, and Models of Computer Programming. I don't know why all these books have terrible titles. Um, but anyways, he says we need to teach programming as a unified discipline. And what does this mean? This means that programming languages are tools. And we need to understand that they're tools. They're specific tools for solving certain problems. And so, in this way, we can kind of understand that JavaScript maybe is solving two problems. It is solving introducing people to programming. And it's also like a programming language that we're writing lots and lots of like enterprise software right now. So maybe that abstraction works for one paradigm and not another. But we do need to understand that we're looking at programming languages as tools that can solve certain numbers of paradigms. Some are multi-paradigms, some are single paradigm. And those paradigms are just problem-solution pairs. All right? And so Peter Van Roy talks about a good way to solve this. We can think about this when we think about teaching JavaScript. He says, a good way to organize a programming course is to start with a simple language and then to extend this language gradually. So we can almost see both a micro pattern and a macro pattern here with JavaScript. 
Like, because it started small, we've adopted it very quickly. Because that's a really good way to learn a programming language. And now we're slowly growing it. But we still have beginners starting. And so we need to circle back. And so for anyone out there who thought class was going to make teaching JavaScript or learning JavaScript easier, that's not the case. All right, we need to understand that we need to start building the abstractions from the very beginning. So we need to invent the universe. Really, we need to go back and start from the beginning. All right? So I'm saying every beginner should write a kernel language like Peter Van Roy said, right? That's good? No, that's a terrible idea. Though I did just do it, and it was kind of fun. Anyways, <laughs> um, what we can take away from this is the creative extension principle. All right? And this just means we don't build abstractions until we feel the pain of their absence, right? And you know, it takes a really long time for a beginner to feel the pain of the absence of a class. Right? It usually doesn't come up in the first several months. Um, and this is not a new, new problem, right? This is something that we've been thinking about forever. Ron Jeffrey says, always implement things when you actually need them, never when you just foresee that you need them. This is like, don't pre-optimize your code, right? Don't pre-optimize your learning. All right, so prototypal inheritance, it's a big part of the JavaScript universe. It's how the apple pie gets made. We're going to have to teach it whether we like it or not. All right? By the way, vegan friendly metaphors. <laughs> so this is a TLDR of all the stuff I just said. Uh, I said a lot of things. I'm not going to read it to you. But I'm going to take the next five minutes and try and take a little meta conversation with you here. I want to ask, what do we even mean when we talk about programming? Yeah, it's going to get a little kumbaya for a moment. All right. So one of my favorite philosophers, Martin Heidegger, he wrote a book called What is Called Thinking. He says, the most thought-provoking thing in a thought-provoking time is that we are still not thinking. And so you can probably guess what I'm going to say. I'm going to ask you, are we programming yet? Remember, that thing we do when we program is we abstract. How many of you feel that joy all the time when you're programming? No one responded, so I'm assuming that no one does. All right? That's a problem. That's ineffective. All right? We kind of come from this culture of, like, it's hard because it's important, and if it wasn't hard, it wouldn't be important. But that's super silly. All right? There are people in the academy who are focusing on this right now. They're building new languages like Racket and Pirate, Scratch, Eve. Eve is basically based on the premise that the best, most successful programming language is Excel. And if that makes you mad, good. You should look at this programming language, because Excel is programming. Anyways, the problem here is that this is being focused on in the academy, not the industry. Instead, what is the industry doing? It's adding things like class to JavaScript. All right? This is Thomas Kuhn. He's an amazing kind of like hybrid philosopher scientist. And he says this, scientists work from models acquired through education and the subsequent exposure to literature, often without quite knowing or needing to know what characteristics have given them these models the status of community, community paradigms? Why did we want class? Have we asked ourselves? All right, we have an awesome opportunity to think more radically about how we extend JavaScript. There's not many languages with this much adoption right now that have this opportunity. All right, we have an awesome opportunity to more radically think but how we build abstractions in general. Because remember, these are the building blocks of our cultures and communities. And we're in a place where we can actually do this. So I'll leave you with this Carl Sagan quote. It is far better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in delusion, however satisfying and reassuring. So let's reconsider our ontology the vocabulary we think we need. Let's reconsider it early 
and often. And most importantly, let's stay beginners. Thank you. presentation on this, um, but I don't think we have time. If you enjoyed this, I have students who made a website for me uh, that they have analytics on. So if you want to tweet about this talk, if you tweet about it with this hashtag, they all have their computers open and will watch like GIFs and all your things. So if you want to give them a shout out since they taught me everything I know. Anyway, thank you. Thank you.